Okay, I want to talk to you a bit more about the glory of God We're talking about the, the glory of God and the way in um, When we talk about the glory of God, you know, we're talking about the, the, um, the two words used for um, glory One is the Hebrew word kabod, and the Greek word is doxa and both of them really speak about the, the very nature and the life of a life force the nature and the essence of God the very essence of God we talk about the glory of God we're talking about his very life force his nature his essence it's just like as the air to us, is to us on earth we need the air to live and breathe and so the glory is to your spirit you need it to live and breathe. Your spirit needs the glory of God. It needs to be exposed to the glory of God. But it's more than that. The glory of God is all that God is. It is the goodness of God. It's the emanation of all that God is. You think of all that God is, the glory of God is, is it's wrapped up in the glory of God. It's the emanation of all that God is. The very, very life of God. And... Um, you know, God wants to glorify you. He wants you to carry His glory and His presence. We're not talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We're talking about the presence, the person. God wants to glorify you. He wants you to carry um, His presence, the very person, the very essence um, of the Lord Himself, the Lord Jesus Himself. We're familiar with Isaiah chapter 60 where it speaks about the glory of God. In verse 1, Arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. You've got to remember that Isaiah prophesied this at a time for a time in which you and I are living. We've heard a lot about this scripture, but he prophesied it for this day. He said there's going to come a time in the end times when the glory of the Lord is going to arise upon the church. Okay? And it said, Behold darkness, it will be in time when darkness should cover the earth, gross darkness the people during that time period, but the Lord shall arise upon you and it says his glory shall be seen upon you it's something that's visible his glory shall be seen upon you visibly seen the result of that is and the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising and so he's saying Isaiah is saying in the time he's prophesying that about our day and age in the time when darkness prevails in the earth God's glory is going to come upon his people rise upon his people this presence of the Lord will be so strong that it will be visible people will look at you and say that person is so different what is it about that person there will be a visible presence the glory of the Lord shall arise upon you it will be visible and then people the unsaved will be drawn to you Okay, this is an end time manifestation of the presence of God people will be drawn to you and the results of Isaiah 60 verse 4 lift up your eyes round about and see all they, they shall gather themselves together and come to you your son shall come from a father your daughter shall be nursed at your side then thou shalt see and flow together your heart shall fear and be enlarged why? because the abundance of the sea humanity shall be converted unto you and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto you and so you see it's part of God's harvest strategy in a time when darkness covers the earth he said I'm going to rise upon the church and his glory is going to um, arise upon you it's going to be so intense it's going to be so real that it will be literally visible people will look at you in the supermarkets people will look at you and say there's something on that person there's a brightness there's, a, there's something on that person what is it? what do you have? the glory of the Lord has risen upon you and he said when this begins to happen it's going to result in a tremendous harvest taking place you will flow together you're not, and your heart shall free and be enlarged the abundance of the sea or the abundance of humanity shall be converted and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto you they shall gather themselves to you they'll come and ask when it's easy when people come to you it's going to be a lot easier when people come to you and say what is it what you've got we want I want what you've got somebody stops you in the supermarket and says what you've got I want that's an easy way to witness isn't it the day is coming and the glory of the Lord is going to be so strong upon the people of God that the drawing power of that okay and um, 
You know, when God begins to do something new, he first brings forth a teaching or truth about whatever he's planning to do. One, it's prophesied. There's a prophetic word that comes through across the body of Christ. That might take two or three years. A prophetic word of what God wants to do. And it keeps coming out here, there, and all over the place. Then there will come some teaching on that. And then there'll be an entering into it. And usually, I've noticed through the years, you know, this process over and over again. For instance, in, in the early early 70s, late 60s and early 70s, there came a lot of teaching, particularly through Watchman Nee, but then it, it was picked up by a lot of others on the, tri- the tripart nature of man. And um, it was quite common in those days to start your message with a drawing three rings on the blackboard. Some of you will remember that. You know, body, soul, and spirit. And everything was preached out of that. And I remember for about four or five years, you know, there was always a blackboard behind. Body, soul, and spirit. There was kind of an emphasis. There was a kind of a teaching. And then, then God began with the charismatic move and poured out his spirit. And we, we had a move of God which we called deliverance. How many of you know, if we hadn't had that teaching, we would have been in big trouble? Because we didn't begin to realize that, you know, Christians were fine in their spirit if they were born again, but they had problems in the second ring, their soul, and they definitely had problems in their body. It was like God prepared the way with teaching to enter into a new, new thing that God was going to do. And we've seen that right through church history. Um, the truth comes, it's prophesied, then the truth comes, we begin to enter in. For instance, also in the, in the mid-70s or, or early 70s, there came an emphasis on the Great Commission to take the gospel to every nation. And so that, that kind of emphasis began to come forth uh, uh, very, very strongly. You get visiting speakers through that speak about it. You get someone else to the big convention that speak about it. This was the kind of the emphasis, you know, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why one was in the beginning of its heyday and it was flourishing and going to all the world. All kind of these things were beginning to happen and there came an emphasis on the Great Commission, teaching on it, gospel to every nation. Then there came a mission thrust. From the church I was pastoring at the time, we had over 42 full-time missionaries on the field. Such was an emphasis of global um, evangelism. First, the vision. There's a prophetic vision. There's a prophet prophecy. It's prophesied. And that might take two or three years. Just the prophetic thing keeps coming forth. Then it comes teaching on it. And uh, then there's a beginning to kind of experience it or begin to enter into it. Now today, uh, how many of you know that for a number of years now, God has been prophesying about the glory of God. For a number of years, at least five or six years, maybe a bit longer, God has been prophesying, there's been prophecies, particularly from Isaiah chapter 60, you know. And um, there's been a fair bit of teaching on it, and, and, and there needs to be some more, of course, but there's an, there was an emphasis, there is an emphasis of the glory of God. And, uh, you know, it's about to come forth, it's about to be entered into, it's about to be experienced. In fact, it's beginning to start. And, um, you know, with this comes a new understanding, I believe, of two things. Worship and waiting on God. Two things are going to come to the fore. We've seen a move of intercession. We've seen intercession begin to pick up over the last few years. An understanding of intercession over the last two or three years. And it's beginning to come to a rightful place. And there's still a lot more teaching to come on that. Intercession, you see, it's begin to be established. Worship. Um... A lot of what we call worship is not worship, it's praise, you know? There's a huge difference between praise and worship. Um, And we're going to come to a new understanding of worship and a new understanding of how to wait on God. How to wait on God um, individually, on your own, quietly, on your own. And then how to wait on God corporately. It's a lot more difficult to wait on God corporately because we disturb each other in the service, you know, and the kids running around and this happens and somebody sneezes and this happens. Somebody drops their keys on the floor and you're kind of in and out and in and out and you can't focus as God. It's very difficult to get corporate people to wait on God, but it can be done. Um, It's, um, you know, we have understood and we've entered into praise, okay? We know and understand what praise is and its place in the body. Praise is very important. I'm not saying that praise is not important. It's very, very important because if there is a power in praise when we're dealing with the enemy, there's a power in praise to to sanitize the atmosphere, you know, just disinfect the whole atmosphere. 
It pushes back powers of darkness. Praise is important. Because sometimes you start a service and it's heavy. And only praise can break it. You can start with worship. Praise has its place. It's very, very important. But we have to learn um, to enter into worship and waiting on God. Last week we talked about the ark returning. Beginning to return. The ark of the covenant. And uh, the tabernacle of David being rebuilt. I don't want to go over that again today. I think you fully understand the, the building of the tabernacle of David again in the church. And how that the, the Old Testament and the New Testament speak about the building of the tabernacle of David, that period of time. And um, the, the, the ark was brought back, began to be brought back with singing and dancing and praise. Okay. And uh, that, we've seen that now, we've seen the ark slowly return. We've, we've seen... That we've seen praise in the church for quite a long time now and um, but the whole once that ark is coming into its place it requires worship to lock into it praise is the road in which it was brought back on okay now we talked about that last week we talked about those who touched the ark and died before the presence of God and that's still a very real reality today when God is about to move from the new to the old, it is always dangerous. And we have to let God do what he wants to do and keep out of the way. Because finally when God says, I'm going to move, and he starts to move, anybody that's in the way, well, it's like being in the way of a double-decker bus. You're in the way, okay? God cannot stop once he starts. Okay, and so we need to understand that. And so the, uh, the ark began to return with praise, okay? And, but it is worship that locks us into it. Now, the whole idea was the ark was the manifest presence of God. To bring back the presence of God, worship and waiting on God has to come to the fore. Now, this requires an entirely new mindset. Um, it requires a change, a change in church services. Um, you know, worship, worship and waiting on God takes time we're aware of that you know you can praise God 10-15 minutes but you cannot do that in worship okay you can't do it and so it requires a whole different mindset um, worship and waiting takes time it cannot be tied to the clock it requires a different kind of mindset in regard to a church service okay it requires a new wine skin for us to fit into what God wants next. We understand praise in the service. It takes up a large part of the service and it's part of things the way we know and all charismatics understand that today. Praising God and celebration. We understand that and there will always be a place for that. But if we want the manifest presence of God, the church has got to learn how to worship. And the church has got to learn how to wait on God. There will be the noisy times and that's important. Celebration is important. Praise is important. But if we want to enter into the eternal realm in our services, it's going to require a new level, a new kind of worship. And a new kind um, of waiting on God. Can't be rushed. Can't be tied to the clock. It's going to require a whole different mindset as to what a church service should be like. That's why it makes it that's why it is so difficult. Because we know how a church service runs, right? You all know what to expect, right? We come, we sing, we worship, we sing a few songs for a while, we just worship for a little while, and then we have the ministry of the word, and then you know maybe God will move at the end and we all go home. Okay, so we, we know exactly, you know, how a charismatic service operates. We just know how that to change that to change that for most people is traumatic and for most pastors it's worse than traumatic <laughs> okay. to change it is very difficult it is really really difficult and um, because um, it requires a whole new, new mindset it will take faith and courage to break from the old to something very different and untried you know and um, it was uh, there's always a problem. You know, I remember in the early 70s, in the beginning of the charismatic move, when, when praise came in, I tell you, it was something so new and so different 
and half of the congregations in most charismatic, so-called charismatic churches left. And uh, it was a frightening time because they couldn't handle something new. Once you start to move a congregation into something that they're not used to, there's a great insecurity. They just don't know where it's going to go next, and they don't know what you don't know what's expected of you. So what do you do? You sit there and look at the leader and watch what he does. <laughs> Change. It's very difficult to bring in. And it's, it's a lot easier to bring it in in a small group than in a big group. In fact, it's almost impossible to bring this kind of change into a large group initially. And um, it's going to take some faith and courage to break from it. And two things that God wants to teach us is one is how to worship. And secondly, how to wait on God. Waiting on God, as I said, individually is one thing. We need to be taught how to do that. Waiting on God corporately is a little different. And we need to be taught on that. You know, there are degrees of God's presence. There are ascending planes of spiritual reality. Different levels of God. And um, praise, the difference between praise and worship are very, very different. You know, how many of you know that praise doesn't require a relationship with the Lord? You don't have and have to have any real relationship with God to praise. Okay? Um, it does not require the surrender of your lives. You can be born again, but you know, your life might be not surrendered to God. Praise doesn't require any real relationship. Anyone can praise God. Even the unsaved can praise God. Okay? And, um, you know, praise focuses the soul, the physical body and the soul unto God. And that's important. Worship focuses your spirit uh, on God. Praise brings a soulish focus, which is important because when I'm talking about a soulish focus, I'm not talking about it in a negative sense, I'm talking about the focus of your mind and your emotions and your will. The soulish focus as far as putting your will into doing what's required. Um, that soulish focus. Worship brings a spirit focus. Okay. Well, just to look at the word um, worship just for a few moments today. The Hebrew word is, is the Hebrew word, I'll spell it here because it's difficult to pronounce. It's S H O K H O H. Shokop. S H O K H O H. It means simply to bow down. To bow down. The Greek word is a, 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 another word which is, which is similar, it's proskuneo, a Greek word proskuneo, it's P-R-O-S-K, P-R-O-S-K-U-N-E-O, proskuneo, and it means to prostrate oneself and kiss, to prostrate oneself and kiss, and so the Hebrew word means to bow down. The Greek word means to prostrate oneself and kiss. And so we see from both the Greek and the Hebrew words for worship, we have the meaning to bow down, to worship, to revere, to kiss. It's an act of loving. An act of loving. That is very different to praise. Alright? Um, it's sometimes we kind of confuse praise or praise and worship as being the same thing. It's very, very difficult. It involves an intensity Worship involves an intensity of love and emotion, love and devotion unto the Lord. There's an intensity. The easiest way for you to connect with God is to love Him with an intensity. If you begin to love God with an intensity, you will connect real quick. It's, 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 a, it's a prime thing that's required. Just love God. Just begin to reach out and really begin to love God and you'll connect real quickly with Him. That's the thing that connects you with God quicker than anything else. And this is what worship is about. It involves an intensity of love and devotion. Your spirit man is focused on and begins to worship Jesus in an, in an intensity. Now, this will take you into a dimension, into the spirit where you've never been before. Can't, this will take you far, much further than praise. And we're going to look at that today. We're familiar with the scripture in John chapter 4, 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 says, But the hour is come, and now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
for God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, John 4, 23. He's talking about worship. And it's a very important passage of scripture. The hour come is cometh and now is, Jesus was saying, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and if you're going to worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth, what does that mean? How do we worship God in spirit and in truth? We worship the Father in spirit. Now, one of the problems with the, with the, um, the, King, well, the, the English Bible, which we've got, when we come to the word spirit in the Bible, there is no indication whether it's talking about the human spirit or the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the translators made a good stab at it and put a capital S there. But often they were wrong. The word spirit is just used and there's no indication apart from context. Obviously there's a context there which is showing which it's talking about. So quite often the word spirit or pneuma, the Greek word, um, we, we're not sure. It's not, it's not always clear in the King James Version. And, and we, we, we need to look at the context. We need to look at it. Spirit and truth. What is Jesus talking about here? And, he's in, and the, most of the Greek scholars tell us that in, in this particular passage of Scripture, they that worship him in spirit and truth. It's not talking about your human spirit. It's talking about the ability of the Holy Spirit in you. Now, it's really important to understand that we worship the, by the operation of the Holy Spirit through your spirit. And, and, and the context of the Greek is quite clear. Bullinger is very strong on this and, and many other Greek scholars that it is not talking about your human spirit. It's talking about worshipping God through by an operation of the Holy Spirit through your spirit. And... Um, it's not just your human spirit worshipping God, but it's the Holy Spirit through your spirit. And particularly, this is so when we worship God in other tongues. Okay? When we worship God in other tongues. You know there are those that say you shouldn't just speak in tongues unless there's an interpretation. Um, you know, we, we're talking about two different things here. We're not talking about the gift of tongues and interpretation. We're talking about praying in the spirit. Okay, there's a very big difference between one is a gift and one is not. Just praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues. Um, and as we begin to, and primarily here we're talking particularly praying in tongues or worshipping God in other tongues. Okay, and so he that worship God, he's talking about the outcomes and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father through the Holy Spirit. Through God working in you and through your spirit. And um, we need to understand that, that as we begin to get into the worship, it's not from this level, the mind level, which often which praise is from here. We praise God by an act of our will and our mind. And we praise God. Worship in spirit is we get into a flow of the Holy Spirit, whether it is praying or singing in the spirit, singing in tongues. Paul said, I will sing in his own language, he said, I will sing in the spirit. I will pray in my own language, he said, I will pray in the spirit. And so praying in the spirit, the, the, obviously he's talking about praying in other tongues. One in his own language, one in the spirit. Singing in his own language, singing in the spirit. And so we're talking about praying in the spirit, praying in other tongues, and worshipping God in spirit. Okay? Or it may be inspirationally just by the Holy Spirit, it might be in English, but you're worshipping God through an operation of the Holy Spirit. All right? It's a flow of the Holy Spirit. This is, he seeks people to worship him that way. Um, spirit and truth. What does it mean to worship him in truth? I've heard lots of sermons on this by saying, you know, you've got to worship him. If you're going to worship him in truth, your life has to be right. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, I've heard people say, if you want to worship God in, 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 in truth, it's got to be um, incorrect, you know, according to the Bible. It's not talking about that at all. Okay, let me explain it to you. It's from the Greek word uh, aletheia. And it means simply in reality. Bullinger, uh, the Greek scholar, translates it revealed reality. Okay? 
Now let me explain this to you. If we put these two words together, we have a clear understanding of what Jesus was saying. God wants you to worship him by allowing the Holy Spirit to move through you in worship. Bringing you into the reality and appearance and the realm of God and eternity. Now, one of the problems you see with the Western world is had a mindset for so long. That's why I was so glad for Sardu to come through and teach on some of the things that he taught. Because if I taught on them, people, people look at you sideways. Well, we have taught on a lot of those things, but carefully. Um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, there's a problem in the Western world. One of the problems with the Western world, we have a religion that we understand by faith. But it's not a reality. Okay? Now, God wants to change that. And the whole idea of worship is to change that. It's to bring us into another dimension. God wants you to worship Him in spirit. Okay? And truth. Truth being entering into the reality of the realm on which God lives. Now where does God live? He lives in eternity. He lives in spirit. He lives in heaven. He, he lives in heavenly places. We've talked about that. What heavenly places is. And it's entering into that realm when you worship. So that these things are not something which we know about in the Bible and one day we might experience them in a great by and by but we can enter into it now. You can enter into it now. Okay. The step it means to, 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 in truth, the truth is the word to choose for reality. Reality. To step into eternity, the realm of the spirit, heavenly places in your worship. In, you step in. He wants us to worship in truth. In that, in the reality of God's realm. In the reality of where angels live and dwell. In the reality where God is. Into stepping into that reality of it. Not just the knowledge of it. Remember the two Greek words for knowledge. Remember? One was gnosis and the other was epinosis. I've taught you a lot about that. Gnosis simply means intellectual knowledge. Epinosis simply means knowledge by encounter and experience. And God wants us to have epinosis, not just the knowledge, but knowledge by experiencing it or encountering it. It's the same with truth. You can have truth. There's a Greek word that's used for truth, and it's purely an intellectual understanding. Truth. Doctrine. Truth. The other word, aletheia, is reality. It's like epinosis and knowledge. It's the reality of it, the experience of it. Not just an imagination of it, the reality and experiencing it. We step into eternity, the realm of spirit, heavenly places in your worship. In the reality, you step into the reality of God's world, realm. You pass through the veil into the presence of God, transcends the mind, and you get into the glory realm. Now, this is, the, this is where worship, true worship, will take you. And God says here, God longs for this kind of worship. He said, the hour has come and now is when true worshippers are going to learn how to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in reality. Step into that realm where he lives and where he is. I think at least a portion of the church is getting over the kind of false doctrine that you cannot see Jesus. Okay, the church believed for years that you couldn't see Jesus. And so they didn't. It was as simple as that. It was one of the greatest lies of the enemy. And, um, you know, it was only for super saints, the special people in the Bible. Okay? And uh, there is seeing Jesus, obviously, on different levels. But worshipping God is stepping into his realm in spirit and reality, spirit and truth. He seeks such to worship him in that realm. So that it's not dull and boring, it's not something we know intellectually, but you can actually get into the realm where he lives. Okay? And worship will begin to take you into that realm. It's into the glory realm. It's into the eternity. It's into the realm where God lives. God is a spirit. And if we're going to worship him, worship him, we've got to be in spirit. We worship him in spirit and reality. 
You see, it's all right, easy to worship per- a person who you can see, but God is a spirit, and you've got to be in the same mode as He is in. You've got to live, get into the same realm in which He is in. Worship. He said, He longs for people. The hour come, and now is when true worshipers will worship Him in spirit and reality. Get into that realm. And um, the reality of God's realm. You pass finally through the veil into the reality of the presence of God where he lives. In the Old Testament, he dwelt behind the veil. In the tabernacle of Moses, he was behind the veil. Okay? And uh, the outer court was fine. The holy place was fine. But if you got through the veil, you went to the manifest presence of God. Now the people were not able to do that because it'd been made, no atonement had been made for sin. And so if they'd gotten into the presence of God, they would die. Okay. Now, through the, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says Jesus took that, the, the, the veil was torn from top to bottom. A way was made through the blood of Jesus because our sins can be forgiven. We can stand in holiness in his presence. We can come into the presence of God. Okay. In Numbers 7.89 it says, And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubims and God spoke to him. What happens, you see, he got in, he got into the holiest of all through the veil which was not just some little curtain, it was about six inches thick. It was a very thick veil. And um, some say that there was no opening in the veil. Most of the Jewish people would say there was no opening in that veil. The, the, the high priest went through supernatural. Okay? Now whether that be so or not, I don't know. But he could only get in on one day of the year. But we can go through that veil. We can pass through that veil into spirit. Into the realm of God. And it was there that God spoke with him. In the outer court... Uh, of the tabernacle of Moses in the outer court there was service unto God and that's important the things we do service unto God and one another and the holy place speaks of the soul and so the outer court was the body service unto God the holy place was the soul where our mind and emotions are centered on God and we begin to worship before the veil and then you pass through the veil to worship into the reality of spirit okay now the scripture I read to you last week from John chapter 7 when the Lord appeared to me spoke to me those scriptures in John chapter 17 rather John chapter 17 um, he said the hour has come okay the hour has come it's come for God to do something new something fresh in the earth and uh, so that the sun might be glorified and uh, and then in verse 24 it says Father I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am what for? that they might behold my glory which you have given me for that you love me before the foundation of the world now just looking at that verse on the surface it says yes fine but it said Father I would that those whom you have given me those who have been born those who are in the family of God born into the family of God that they be with me where I am that they might behold my glory where is he? where is he right now? And where is the Lord Jesus right now? he's in spirit he's in he's in heavenly places he's in the realm of eternity he's in spirit now he's saying look father he said those that you give me you know and uh, have given me be with me where I am that they might behold my glory okay that's where he wants us to go that's where he wants us to get into Um, in the realm you see of spirit passing through the veil into the reality of the spirit you see your human spirit can, is, is quite at home in that realm your brain isn't it has real problems with that realm because your brain is too logical but your, your spirit has a higher knowledge the spirit the Bible tells us the spirit searches the deep things of God okay your spirit has a higher intelligence 
your spirit has a different relationship with the realm of spirit than your brain does. And when you begin to worship God, you're not worshiping, not in the realm of praise, you're not from the mind anymore, you're worshiping God in spirit. You transcend the natural, you come through the veil into the presence of God. You see, and the Bible tells in 2 Corinthians 18, it says, Beholding Him, we are changed from one level of glory to another. How do you behold Him? By getting in there. You can't behold Him in this realm. You behold Him in that realm, the realm of spirit. The two exist together. That it has to be a consciousness of you being in that realm to behold Him. When you behold Him, then you are changed. And the change that God wants to bring to the church can only come this way. The church has gone as far, and I'm talking the church generally, has gone as far as, can, as it can go. Now it has to come into a new dimension. The glory realm. And God said, arise and shine in these last days, his glory is going to rise upon the church. How is he going to do that? By beholding him. And that's what Jesus said. He said, Father, I will that those who have given me be with me where I am, that's in the Spirit, that they might see my glory. And then they're going to be changed. You see, when Moses came out of the glory of God, whether he was in the tabernacle or up on the mountain, when he came out of the glory of God, his face shone. He'd been in that realm with God. And when he came out, he didn't know his face was shining. But the people did. Now see, this is what Isaiah was prophesying about. He said, and, and if you read through the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 18, it talks about the glory of the Old Testament, the glory of the New Covenant. It's going to be far greater than the Old. Remember in the Old Testament it says that the, the priest could not stand to minister because the glory came down and filled the tab- presence of God. We really haven't seen that. We get touches of it. But you see, the glory of God is coming back to the church. The ark is coming back. The manifest presence of God is coming back um, to the church of Jesus Christ. And that glory is going to be manifest again. You come out of that presence and you come out of that realm. You bring something from that realm into this realm with you. Okay? You bring something out of that realm into this realm. You know, angels can only stay so long on the earth because they begin to diminish. Their glory begins to diminish unless they find their way back home for a while. And as long as, see, that realm, it, we've got to spend a lot of time in that realm if we're going to carry that presence of the Lord. Get out of that and it diminishes. Get back into it and it increases. When Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone. Now it doesn't say for how long his face shone. Whether it was a few days, a few hours, a few weeks, it doesn't say that. But eventually it waned. Okay, eventually it kind of left him. But if he'd gone up the next week, he would have come down again with even more. Alright, now the Bible, 2 Corinthians 18 says, Beholding him, we are changed from one level of glory to another, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you get into that realm, you bring something out of that realm, you see, into the natural realm and it's visible. And there are going to be times when, when whole congregations are going to be so caught up in that realm and after church service is over and people start going out of the doors, people are going to wonder who these people are because they'll be emanating the glory and the presence of God. And he says the glory of God is going to arise upon the church. And we've got to learn how to get into that realm. We know how to worship we, sorry, we know how to praise God, but we really don't know how to worship. If we learn how to worship, we will get in. And we'll come out with something we didn't have before we went in. And the more we do that, the more it will be upon us. And so God said, you know, the, God prophesied through Amos in the Old Testament, Amos 9:11. He said, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And when Amos prophesied this, the tabernacle of David is long gone. The ark had been taken out and put into Solomon's temple. The glory is gone. The open manifestation of the glory had gone from Israel. So when he was prophesying this, it was long after the tabernacle of David had been built in the days of David, you know, with the ark on Mount Zion in an open tent. Those days had long gone. Now Amos begins to prophesy again. He said, look, he said, you guys, this is going to happen again. 
And so he's saying, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that's fallen. Close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up its ruins and I will build it again as in the days of old. And so we pick it up again. You see, in, in Acts chapter 15, in the New Testament, Acts 15, 15, and, and to this agree the words of the prophets. He is saying, he's talking about Amos, as it is written. After this I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. God is building again the tabernacle of David. Spiritually, obviously, it is a place in God where his manifest presence is known. Where his, his manifest presence is. Manifestation of the presence of God. A literal, visible manifestation of the presence of God it was in Zion the place where God's manifest glory was remember he took the, took the ark took it up onto Mount Zion put it in the tent and the glory shone forth for 40 years one whole generation very interesting because David wrote a lot of his psalms during that 40 year period a lot of his psalms were written during that 40 year period and uh, he makes reference to this a lot for instance in Psalm 102 16 when the Lord shall build up Zion he shall appear in his glory how many of you know the Lord's going to build up Zion again and he's going to appear to the church in his glory I want to tell you you know God has no, no problem with, with the harvest he's going to do it I want to tell you, when there's a manifestation of the, the presence of God in church every week, you won't have enough place to put the people. Okay? And that's what it's all about. You won't have enough place to put the people. It'll be, it'll be so small, you know, you need more seats. Okay? It, it'll be filled with people. Okay? Now, he says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he's going to appear in his glory. Oh, that's a very it's a great psalm that oh, we can't be, you know, it's a great psalm Psalm 132 verse 13 for the Lord has chosen Zion he has desired it for his habitation for the place in which he will dwell Psalm 15 verse 2 out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined this is the glory there are so many psalms which deal with this ok and so we stand before the veil the altar of incense was before the veil with intercession, worship and waiting on God and you'll go through the veil and you'll just transcend this realm into that next realm into the manifest presence of God take us through the veil come with me if you have your Bibles into Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 these are some of the scriptures that the Lord was talking to me about last week and um, <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12 talking about he's speaking to spiritual Christians okay you've got to get the context he's talking about he's talking to charismatics here people who flow in the gifts of the spirit okay people who speak in tongues in verse 18 he says for you are not come to the month that might be touched and burnt with fire and into blackness and darkness and tempest. He's talking about the children of Israel when they came to Mount Sinai. Remember? And um, that is when they, they had the tabernacle of Moses, and they, they, or at least they came to Mount Sinai. And um, it spoke of a Pentecostal experience. They went 50 days and came to Zion. Pentecost, 50 days, kept the feast and they, there. And verse 19, and we said, But you're not come to this, you can't stay there. It says, In the sound of the trumpet, verse 19, um, and the voice of words which voice they heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore incredible you know they, they said God speaks off the top of the mountain and it's so bad they said to Moses tell him not to do that to us again you read it in the Old Testament it says he they entreated God not to speak to them that way again I mean, some, some said it was like thunder from the top of the mountain. And they said, God, Moses, you talk to God for us. We don't want to be exposed to that again. It was such an awesome thing. You are not come to the mount that might be touched and burnt with fire and blackness and the sound of a trumpet. There were trumpets up there and the voice of words and the voice that they heard in, and they entreated the words should not be spoken to them anymore. But they could not endure it. Okay? 
and, uh, and it was so that even if a beast, beast touched the mountain it would be stoned or thrust through and so terrible was the sight that Moses said I exceedingly fear and quake he said but verse 22 you and he's talking to charismatic tongues talking people in the New Testament Hebrew church you have come to Mount Zion okay just stop there for a minute he's come to Mount Zion he said this is beyond Pentecost that this is another realm. This is beyond the gifts of the Spirit. You know? You're now going to meet and live with a person, not just know the gifts. And so he said, now you've come into Mount Zion. What was on Mount Zion? The open manifestation. The Mount Zion is simply the transference of the holiest of all into an open view. It's a place through the veil. Okay? It's a place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where, where David put it. You have now come into Mount Zion. What's in that realm? Once you step over there, where are you? You're into the realm of eternity. You're in the realm of spirit. You're in the realm where God dwells. So he goes on to say, you've come into Mount Zion. Where? And the city of the living God. And to heavenly Jerusalem. That's this realm and to an innumerable company of angels see, this, morning, this afternoon when we, we begin to sing in worship suddenly there were angels here just before you prophesied with there was an angel standing right in front of you were you aware of that? yeah, he was singing okay, just stood in front see, there's a realm there there's just angels suddenly here and he said, that's, that's a realm which God wants us to live in um, you come, you came to Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church, of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. <laughs> That's two realms, the realms melding together. And maybe you know the church in heaven and the church in earth are slowly, slowly beginning to come together. God said to Daniel, you're going to stand in your place in this age, in this age, in the last days, in the earth. I could tell you a lot about that. It's a fantastic realm. But you mightn't believe me. To the general assembly of the church of the first one, I tell you, I had experience this weekend with this. This is a realm. It, it, it's, you know, the firstborn. We come to the church of the firstborn in heaven. And to the God, the judge of all. And to the spirit of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speak of the better things than of Abel. Okay, this is a realm in Zion. In, if you come through into the next dimension, through worship, we get into that realm. Through worship. If we get into that realm of the spirit, you transcend the natural, and you're not worshipping with the mind anymore, but you're actually in that realm. And you say, well, can I, is that available for me? You know, you read through history and you read through great men and women of God who've touched that realm. Uh, and you read of them and think, you know, well, they were great saints of God. God is going to take the whole church into that realm. The two worlds are going to come together. And this is the whole idea of worship in spirit and the truth or reality of that realm. To step into it. And he said, but, he says, I'm going to do, before that happens, he said, I'm going to do a real shaking. He says, see that you refuse not him that speaks. But they, if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we in turn turn away from him that speaks from heaven. And maybe you know when Sada was here, God was speaking to us from heaven. If we don't hear and respond rightly, we won't come into this realm. And it goes on to say, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promising one more time I will shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. And this word, yet one more, signifying the removing of those things that, can, the things are, that are shaken as the things that are made, the natural things. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom, a new dimension, a new realm, which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we might serve God acceptably with reverence, and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire ok and so the whole context of here in Hebrews chapter 12 is moving on from Pentecost from Sinai onto Mount Zion 
It says, when you get into Mount Zion, the change is listed out. You now come to Zion, to the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. Spirits of just men made perfect. An innumerable company of angels. The realm of spirit. You worship God. God wants to take us into that realm. To worship him. And unto Jesus, the mediator of the covenant. Okay, God is building again the tabernacle of David. You know, coming to Zion, it says, Obey God who is speaking to us to do us. In other words, do what is right. Last week the Lord spoke to me about, you know, the time has come. And God has been speaking and speaking and speaking. And it comes times in the church when if we don't respond, now let me, in case people go away fearful, if God is convicted, God is requiring something of you and you don't do it, there is a grace, a period of grace, and it may be a number of years. There's a period of grace to do it and put it right. If you don't, finally that day of grace closes and sets your level in God. That's what I'm saying. Okay? There was a long, long period. We have to put things right. Put them right. That's not hard, is it? Put them right. You don't have to fear. God's speaking to us. Deal with it. Put it right. You know, and so that we can move on and move into, because this time is going to a close. This time finishes the end of next week. It's, it's close to an end. God wants us to go on. There's a real shaking um, taking place. And uh, there are two ways, you know, um, into Zion. Um, you know, the Jebusites held Zion. Remember the Jebusites? Those, those guys again. They held Zion and kept the people out of Zion. Now, they got as far as Jerusalem, but Zion was another part in Jerusalem. And the Jebusites held it. And nobody dared go in there until one day David said, Look, we're going to bring about the ark. We've got to get the Jebusites out of there. We've got to get rid of them. And the, but they held Zion. They kept out the people from entering Zion. But finally David took it. The Jebusites in scripture speak of those who sowed discord among the brethren. They're the ones. That's what will keep you out of Zion more than. There are other things, but that will keep you out of Zion more than anything else. Keep you out of this realm we're talking about. Those who sow discord among the brethren. The last enemy to be defeated. And they held the people out of Zion. There were seven enemies. There were seven nations which they had to conquer in the promised land coming through. The last was the Jebusites. We pick this up in Proverbs 6, 16, 17, 18, and 19. It says, these six things, even seven, are an abomination unto him. When you look at the first enemy in the land, it was pride. It, 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 as it began to take the promised land. The, the giants they took on, they, 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 the forces they took on were, were the spirit of pride. Okay, a proud look, first enemy. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises of wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies and in the last one and he that sows discord among the brethren the Jebusites seven enemies in the land the last one was the Jebusites okay that one has to be right if you don't get that right you won't get in okay you got to be very very careful very careful put things right if you've been wrong there are two ways in design Isaiah 4.4 4, When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by what? The spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Choose the spirit of burning. Okay. <laughs> That's what the easiest way is. If you get the spirit of judgment, well, the Zion you might get to finally might be the one which is in the great by and by, you know, when you pass from this life. But there's another way in in this life, and that's the spirit of burning. Okay. And as you begin to worship God in spirit and get into the presence of God and behold his glory, it says our God is a consuming fire, you're going to be touched with the fire of God. Once you start getting into that realm through proper worship, into the stepping into the realm of eternity, you're going to be touched with God's fire. And from glory, that will then purify you for another glory. Level of glory. You'll get touched with the fire of God again, and I'll take you to another level of glory. Until you can take much more of the glory and presence of God, and you'll come out glowing with God's presence. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, 
and kings to your brightness, the scripture says. And the abundance of the sea will be converted unto you. But it's through the spirit of bringing, the baptism of fire. Okay? It's through the spirit of burning. And, and, and as, as you come in, you know, to the spirit of burning, then change takes place in a very remarkable way. Okay? The spirit of burning can deal with hereditary, spiritual hereditary problems far greater than any other method I know. The spirit of burning can just burn them right out of your system. Spiritually out. Um, and as we get in and more and more into the presence of God, begin to touch the fire of God more and more, beholding Him, Jesus said, I pray now that those you have given me might be with me that they might behold my glory. One aspect of the glory of God is the fire of God. Glory comes in many forms. One aspect is part of His nature, the fire of God. We stand, we, 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 we are exposed to the fire of God, the glory of God. And we are changed from one level of glory to another. Beholding Him, we are changed from one level to another. We come unto man's eye, the spirit of the city of the living God, the heavenly realm, to an innumerable company of angels. Oh, hallelujah.